we don't record live the music for copyright reasons. So uh, Neil, thanks for checking in and thanks for asking the question. Um, and so just so you know, we've got folks from uh, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, Africa, Oregon, New York, uh, all over the world that join us here. We actually have a much larger audience online than we do in person. Uh, we would like to see if you're local, we'd like you to come on out and join us personally here. I'm going to have Danny come up and uh, pray a blessing over the uh, offering for us. So just so you know, we are a 100% volunteer-driven church. Everything we do here, nobody gets paid a penny. It's all to benefit the recovery community and share the word and the message. So come on up, Danny. Thank you, Lyle. Father God, we just come to you and just thank you for the offerings that you take and multiply and use in your will for these books that we give away here for the books that we bring into the jails just different things that we do with it lord we just thank you for the multiplications that we already have in jesus name amen thank you danny so what he, what he's talking about some of the things we do with the contributions we get is we we give things to folks to help encourage them and grow them and edify them. One thing is we, we give away the life recovery Bibles, um, uh, both here in person and then we do take them out to the jail and, uh, and as they need them, the, the jail is supposed to let us know if they run low and we'll get more. Um, and then we have a, another book we're giving away called Gentle and Lowly, The Heart of Christ for Sinners and Sufferers. So if you're ever here with us in person and you'd like one of those at the end, we, we give those away and I make you wait till the end. You gotta listen to the whole message before you get your free book. So. Um, so uh, we do some other giveaways, and then once a month, the last Saturday of each month is testimony night, and we, uh, we feed you. So if you're able, ever able to make it out here, uh, you get a, a pretty decent meal. And now we've got a new cook coming in, uh, and she is awesome. So Sandy's going to be preparing the meals, uh, and that's probably good, so you don't have to taste the same things I cook over and over. Um, but she, uh, I've eaten her food before. You will like it, okay? Okay. Um, so today we have a, a message. One of the things we do here is we, we, we have a list of 12 basic values. One is raw. We're, we're real, all right? There's nothing polished about us. Uh, we're just from the heart kind of folks. Uh, and then the, one another one is, is uh, the spirit of rotation. So the idea is that other folks from the community, uh, some of our friends in ministry and some of our friends from the 12-step programs will come in and, and share a message. And uh, we have Pam with us this week. Pam uh, runs a, a nonprofit called Wits End. It's uh, largely geared toward women, but she's been doing a series, a 12-week series on why it works. You all have been to 12-step meetings, you've heard how it works. She wants to talk to you about why it works. Now, obviously, she's not gonna be able to give you the whole 12-week series. She doesn't talk quite as long as I do. So um, we don't have time for all 12 weeks tonight, but she's gonna give you a snippet. And uh, come on up, Pam. What? Yeah, Danny's going to pass around the plate. Yeah, and if listen, if you're joining us online and uh, you can't be here to give in person, on Facebook, if you look, we have a website, and there is a donation portal on the website. So if you'd like to be a part of this ministry by giving to it, our website has a real easy one-click uh, kind of thing where you can, you can give. Um, and let me just pray over Pam's message. Please. So, Lord, I just, I just thank you for Pam's heart to share with you, Lord, for her willingness to stand up here and and deliver a word that you've given her. Lord, I pray that uh, you would put the words in her mouth, that you would give her peace through this process and know that you were with her in it. Lord, that it would uh, just lift somebody up, that somebody that needs to hear it, Lord, would hear it, that those words would touch their ears and penetrate their heart, uh, uh, Lord, and that you would just guide her in this process, that it would edify others and glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Give me a 10-minute warning, okay? I was, I, I was putting this together, and I took heart. One of the, Joyce Meyer's my hero, and one of the things Joyce says is, I've got a three-hour message here I've got to give you in 30 minutes. So that's kind of what I'm dealing with here and trying to decide um, what the Lord wanted me to share with you this evening. Um, okay. Jim, are you up there? Yeah. Okay. What I'd like to do first, as I was going through this, since you all aren't familiar with my teaching, is to just lay a basic found work, groundwork, okay, some terms and some understanding that we can work from. Number one, a 12-step program is not a religion. I tell people all the time I am trilingual. I speak 
12 stepish psychobabble and Christianese. And I have been equally beat up in all three arenas for not being enough, whatever. What I have finally decided for myself to make peace between the 12 steppers and the Christian community is the understanding that a 12 step program is not a religion. I've got a section here out of the big book. The only thing I want to share with you is in that page 47 in the big book, it says not all of us join religious bodies, but most. Now, granted, this was a long time ago, but most of us favor such memberships. So one of the main reasons, next that I think people get confused, and again, you, I tell, you don't have to agree with my definitions, you just have to use them. Religion. Religion talks about what happens to you after you die. Can we all agree on that? Doesn't matter what the religion is. The basic premise of the religion is what's gonna happen to you after you die. Revelation. The big book says absolutely nothing about what happens to you after you're dead. It doesn't promise you anything after you're dead. What the 12 step talks about is spirituality. And the definition that I use for spirituality is that it talks about how I live here and now. And that I live here and now with a recognition of an unseen force. And what that force is, is that going to work? We'll see. that I live my life with the recognition that I am not the final authority. What I want, what I think, and what I feel is not the ultimate reality. What the ultimate reality is, is not defined in my understanding of spirituality. Okay, next. When it comes to the 12 steps, I brought some books. Mm, I said, if the road to sobriety or heaven was paved with books, I'd already be there. If you really, now I love this stuff. I'm, I mean, it is like my passion, okay? But if you really want to know about this, this is the book that you want to get. It's called Absolutely Sober. And it goes all the way back to the very beginning. A lot of what I share here tonight comes out of that book. The Christian beginnings are I can hear it too. Starting with most of us who run around in 12-step world know something about the Oxford group. Frank Buckman is the man who brought and created the Oxford group. He actually went to a retreat, a convention retreat in England called Keswick. And I was privileged to meet a woman whose father brought Keswick to the United States. At Keswick, he learned what became the principles for the Oxford group. He was in China and met Sam Shoemaker as a missionary over in China. Sam was totally taken with the principles that Frank Buckman was teaching. And Frank, Sam Shoemaker brought those principles from the Oxford group to Calvary Rescue Mission. Now, this is a rescue mission for homeless just like we have nowadays. No different. There he met Abby. Abby carried the message to Bill and the Oxford group principles 
became the foundation for the 12 steps. Bill W. made it clear that Sam Shoemaker passed on the spiritual key, keys by which we were liberated. And they came from the Oxford group. This is a quote from Sam Shoemaker. AA has been supremely wise, I think, in emphasizing the reality of the experience and acknowledging that it came from a higher power than human and leaving the interpretation part pretty much at that. If AA had said more, some people would have wanted them to say a great deal more. And to find God in an acceptable and congenial way to themselves. It would have taken only two or three groups like this, dissenting from one another, to wreck the whole business. Anybody ever been in a church split? We can't even get a denomination to agree, right? So they stuck to the inescapable experiences and told people to turn their wills and their lives over to the care of God as they understood him. That left the theory and the theology to the churches to which people belong. If they belonged to no church and could hold no consistent theory, then they had to give themselves to God that they saw in other people. Sam said, that's not a bad way to set in motion the beginnings of a spiritual experience. He had no intention that we would stop there. He's talking about a place to start. One of my favorite terms that comes out of Frank Buckman's teaching that I have never read anywhere else, he considered what they did in the Oxford group soul surgery. Soul surgery. I'm like, yeah, exactly. That that is the foundation. The art of soul surgery, as Buckman called it, was to cut sin out of your life by an incisive surgical process using the tools. We're going to talk about those tonight a little bit. Process, a sur incisive surgical process that began with the surrender of your life to God, to God's care and direction and utilizing the power of God to cut out sin. I tell people all the time, the tools of AA are power tools. They are not hand tools. Anybody use power tools? If the electricity isn't on, how well do they work? Yeah, we got to have the power on for power tools. The Oxford group worked with what they called the five C's. And when I look at the five C's, the Christian foundation for the 12 steps becomes much more apparent. The five C's of the Oxford group were, number one, conf confidence. I had to have confidence in God. Not just a theory, personal confidence. Confession, conviction, conversion, and continuance. Clarence, next. All right, now, let me see my little thing up here. Clarence Snyder. Clarence Snyder, and a lot of what I'm going to talk about this evening comes out of this book right here. If you have never been to a Came to Believe um, conference, see me afterwards, we can talk about it. Uh, we've got one in November, retreat. Clarence Snyder was sponsored by Dr. Bob. Clarence started the first AA group in Cleveland in 1939. Now, what, I don't know about you all, I always thought that the problem was, please, I don't mean to offend anybody, he said we were raw, so what I call, the problem was between the Christians and the heathens. Guess where some of the biggest problem was? Between the Christians. Yeah, the Christians. 
because the Roman Catholic priests in Cleveland were refusing to let the Catholics attend the Oxford group meeting in Akron. Why? It was Protestant. Mm -hmm. Anybody know there's a bunch of Catholics that need to get sober? Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of my favorite first conventions I went to, big old convention room, had a sign out in front of a, a, one of their, their room, meeting rooms, and it said CIA meeting here. And I looked and I said, we're in an AA convention and they got the CIA. I said, is that like really a good idea? And everybody falls out laughing at me. They said, no, honey, that's the Catholic Irish alcoholics. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But. There was a problem, and part of the separation of church and AA wasn't because of the unbelievers. It was because of the differences in the believers. Forward to the second edition of Alcoholics. Anonymous says, of the alcoholics who came to AA, I love this, and really tried, I'm not exactly sure who they are, but they really tried, 50% got sober at once. Can you imagine a number like that? I, I ran the women's program at Martin County Jail for 15 years. People used to ask me all the time, well, how many people in your program stayed sober? I'm like, who am I gonna ask? The addict? I know, I'm going to ask their mother, right? Yeah. I have no clue. But the estimate is that nowadays, somewhere in the neighborhood of 10% of the people who come to A. Now, there's a ton of reasons for that. But of the alcoholics who came to AA and really tried 50%, got sober at once and remained that way. 25% sobered up after some relapses. And among the remainder, 25%, who stayed on with AA showed improvement. Other thousands came to a few AA meetings and decided they didn't want the program. But great numbers of these, about two out of three, began to return as time passed. Next. In AA Comes of Age, Bill said, yes, Cleveland's results were the best. These results were, in fact, so good, the AA membership elsewhere was so small that many a Clevelander really thought AA's membership started there in the first place. The Cleveland pioneers had proved that three essential things, the value of a personal sponsor. Anybody ever hear people in meetings say, well, the sponsorship isn't in the big book. No, it's not. We'll talk about that. It started in Cleveland. The power of personal sponsorship, the worth of AA's big book, Clarence Snyder was one of the very first ones to base their meetings on the big book, and indoctrinating newcomers, and finally, the tremendous fact that AA, when the word really got around, could now soundly grow in size. It wasn't just going to be a little group. Bill Wilson made numerous trips to Ohio to try and find out what they had that worked so well. They were struggling in New York. He spoke with Clarence and with Dr. Bob and attended meetings. He tried to bring back the program of recovery as it was in Ohio to the New York members, but they would not assimilate the spirituality into their brand of AA. Emphasis on spirituality was what had made Ohio AA so successful, according to Clarence, that 50% number. Next, Clarence Snyder planted his feet on this verse as the key to recovery. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 and 18. Now, if anyone is enfolded into Christ, he has become an entirely new creation new person, that all that is related to the old order is vanished, and behold, everything is fresh and new. 
Next, Dr. Bob and Clarence. Dr. Bob and Clarence told how our AA program came mostly from the Bible, especially Matthew 5 through 7, the Sermon on the Mount, Corinthians 1, 1 Corinthians 13, the love chapter, and the book of James, which they called the healing book. Just to give you an example, I'm going to run you through how it works. Rarely have we seen a person fail who has thoroughly followed our path. Those who do not recover are people who cannot or will not completely give themselves to this simple program usually men and women who are constitutionally incapable of being honest with themselves. James 1, 6 through 8. May, just make sure you ask, empowered by confident faith, without doubting that you will receive. For the ambivalent person believes one minute and doubts the next. Being undecided makes you become like rough seas, driven and tossed by the wind. You are up one minute and down the next. When you are half-hearted and wavering, it leaves you unstable. Can you really expect to receive anything from the Lord when you're in that condition? James. Our stories disclose, next, in a general way, what we used to be like, what happened, and what we are like now. Revelation 12:11. They overcame by the blood of the Lamb and the word of their testimony. If you have decided you want what we have and are willing to go to any length to get it, then you are ready to take certain steps. James 2, 17 through 19. So when faith doesn't involve action, it's phony. James 1, 22. Don't just listen to the word of truth and not respond to it. For that is the essence of self-deception. What do we talk about in the program? Denial. At some of these we balked. We thought we could find an easier, softer way, but we could not. With all the earnestness at our command, we beg of you to be fearless and thorough from the very start. Some of us have tried to hold our own on to our old ideas and the result was nil until we let go absolutely James 4 don't you know that flirting with the world's values places you at odds with God remember that we deal with alcohol cunning baffling powerful without help it is too much for us but there is one who has all power that one is God May you find him now. James 4, there is one true lawgiver and judge, the one who has the power to save and destroy. Some of the tools that we use in AA. Number one, going to meetings. Frank Buckman was one of the advocates of what he called house parties. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read that, I went like, yeah, now we're talking. No, no. He had what probably would be more like what we would call a home church now, but because he worked a lot with young people on college campuses, he called them house parties. But what the power that he wanted to convey in those house parties was the power of personal relationship. Not being in some place, but in somebody's house, starting with his. It was personal. You got to know him. And one of my personal favorites, he was a huge advocate of lunch meetings. Noon meetings. Everybody would come have lunch together. Hebrews 10, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. Let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another. Acts 2, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, 
to the breaking of bread and to prayer. Next, prayer. Step 11 says, step 11 suggests prayer and meditation. And it says we shouldn't be shy on this matter of prayer. Better men than us are using it constantly. There are, I didn't know this, I, there are at least 28 prayers in the big book. 28 prayers. Every time it says, we said to God, we, it, it, it's talking about prayer. Matthew 26, watch and pray that you will not enter into temptation. The spirit is indeed, indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Matthew 21, whatever you ask in prayer, you will receive if you have faith. Next, sponsorship. I told you we were going to talk about it. No, they did not have sponsorship in the early years, and it's not mentioned in the first 164 pages of the big book. The actual first recognized sponsorship relationship was not so much Ebby and Bob, though you could, he brought that, but it was Clarence and Dr. Bob. Clarence actually was taken through the steps by Dr. Bob. Dr. Bob modeled a style of one-on-one -on -one sponsorship, and Clarence wrote the first pamphlet on sponsorship. The spiritual principle underlying sponsorship, 2 Timothy 2. You then, my child, be strengthened by the grace that is in Christ Jesus and what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses entrust to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. This process of carrying the message and raising other people up is the spiritual principle of discipleship. done by Jesus. Next, admitting powerlessness. The big book says most of us have been unwilling to admit we were real alcoholics. The idea that somehow, someday, he will control and enjoy his drinking is the great obsession of every abnormal drinker. The persistence of this illusion is astonishing Many pursue it into the gates of insanity or death. 1 John 1 8. If we boast and say we have no sin, we are only fooling ourselves and are strangers to the truth. Denial. Sharing our stories. Our stories disclose in a general way what we used to be like what happened and what we are like now. Revelation 12, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and the word of their testimony. Taking action. If you have decided you want what we have and are willing to go to any length to get it, then you are ready to take certain steps. James 2, so then faith that doesn't involve action is phony. And James 1, don't just listen to the word of truth and not respond to it, for it is the essence of self-deception. Again, another time in James. Service. This is a quote from Bill W., while I lay in the hospital, the thought came that there were thousands of hopeless alcoholics who might be glad to have what had been so freely given to me. Perhaps I could help some of them. They, might, they in turn, might work with others. My friend had emphasized the absolute necessity of demonstrating these principles in all of my affairs, particularly 
was it imperative to work with others as he had worked with me. Faith without works was dead, he said, and how appallingly true for the alcoholic. For if an alcoholic failed to enlarge, perfect and enlarge his spiritual life through work and self-sacrifice to others, he could not survive the certain trials and low spots ahead. If he did not work, he would surely drink again, and if he drank, he would surely die. Then faith would be dead indeed. With us, it is just like that. What good is it, my brothers and sisters? This is James again, James 2, 14 through 17. What good is it, my brothers and sisters, if someone claims to have faith and no deeds? Can such faith save them? Suppose a brother or sister is without clothes and daily food. If one of them says, go in peace and keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs, what good is it? In the same way, faith by itself is not a company that is not accompanied by action is dead. John 13, Jesus said, if I, if I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you should do as I have done. First Peter, each of has received a gift to use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. The power of making amends. The big book says, now we go out to our fellows and repair the damage done in the past. We may attempt to sweep away the debris which is accumulated out of our effort to live on self-will and run the show ourselves. If we haven't the will to do this, we ask until it comes. Remember, it was agreed in the beginning that we would go to any length for victory over alcohol. Matthew, therefore, if you are offering your gift at the altar and there remember that your brother or sister has something against you, leave your gift at the altar and go first and be reconciled to them. Then come and offer your gift. James, confess and acknowledge you have offend, offended one another and then pray for one another to be instantly healed. Taking our inventory. Next, we launched out on a vigorous course of action, the first step of which was a personal house cleaning. Many of us had never attempted, though our decision was a vital and crucial step, it could have little permanent effect unless at once followed by a strenuous effort to face and be rid of the things in ourselves which had been blocking us. The first time I ever heard that, I mean, heard it, right? Y'all know what I'm saying? Hear, hear. I was listening to a Joe and Charlie tape a long time ago, cassette tape in my car. And they said that the big book says that our third step could, could is a power word. Our third step would have the power for little permanent effect unless at once followed. I've listened to so many people say, I know the reason I didn't make it is because I, I didn't do my third step. I didn't do my third step. I'm going, well, I don't know. Did you do, did you do your fourth step? Well, no. Right here in the big book. It says it could have little permanent effect unless at once. I tell people all the time, if you're going to put something off, don't put off your fourth step. 
put off your third step, not your fourth. First John, if we boast and say we have no sin, we're only fooling ourselves and are strangers to the truth. Matthew 7, first acknowledge your own blind spots and then you will be capable of dealing with the blind spots of your friend. The power of confession. We pocket our pride and go to it, illuminating every twist of character, every dark cranny of the past. Once we have taken this step withholding nothing, we are delighted. We can look the world in the eye. We can be alone at perfect, in perf at perfect peace. Our fears fall from us. We begin to feel the nearness of our Creator. We have had certain spiritual beliefs, but now we begin to have a spiritual experience. The feeling that the drink problem has disappeared will often come strongly. We feel we are on the broad highway, walking hand in hand with the spirit of the universe. Anytime we read the promises in the AA groups I go to, they always read the ninth step promises. I challenge people to read the fifth step promises. <laughs> Confession scriptures. Again, we're back in James, James 5. Therefore, confess your sins one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. First John, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Carrying the message, tradition five. Each group has but one primary purpose, to carry its message to the alcoholic who still suffers. Matthew 28. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain to which God, Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded be, Commanded you. Behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. The spiritual principle behind carrying the message in AA is the spiritual principle behind the Great Commission. It's the same premise. Last but not least, this doesn't come from either one. I share this in closing. One of my all-time most favorite books, I didn't bring it, um, is What's So Amazing About Grace by Philip Yancey. Philip Yancey says, sometimes as I went up and down the stairs connecting our church sanctuary to the basement, I thought of the upstairs-downstairs contrast between Sunday mornings and Tuesday evenings. Only a few of those who met on Tuesday evenings returned on Sundays. Though they appreciated the church's generosity in opening its basement to them. The AA members I talked with said they wouldn't feel at ease in church. Upstairs, people seemed to have it all together while they were just barely hanging on. They felt, next please, they felt more comfortable in the swirl of blue smoke, slouched in metal chairs, in jeans and a t-shirt, using swear words if they felt like it. That's where they belonged. Not in a stained glass sanctuary with straight back pews. If only they realized, if only the church could realize that in some of the most important lessons of spirituality, the members of the basement group were our masters. They began with radical honesty, and they ended with radical dependence. A thirst, they came as jolly beggars every week because AA was the one place that offered 
grace on tap. Thank you. Well, thank you, Pam, very much, very much, and great job. Um, we'll do a few announcements, a little prayer. I, I, real quick, you got to pray for the Miami Hurricanes to play in Alabama right now. So, um, but in, in more serious prayer, um, we do have some members that have been sick and some that have lost some family members, and we want to lift them up in prayer for healing uh, emotionally, spiritually, physically. Danny, who was up here praying over the offering earlier, went through a pretty radical surgery and is still uh, recovering from that, so pray for him. Uh, um, some others, I, I will, I'll let them determine what they want to share, but we have some other physical prayers, physical healing prayers. Um, do pray for, for us as a body as we try and reach more folks and try and get into some of the recovery homes and get them out here to share the, the truth that we have, the love that we have for them. And, and much like she was talking from Philip Yancey's uh, book on grace and but by the way the amazing grace um there's that amazing grace that Gr clarence's wife w was grace that was her name and she was grace embodied um and, and that's really what we want to be to other people here in the recovery church we want to be that raw we want to be where you can be comfortable still receive the message from the scriptures in the 12 steps but in a place where you don't feel like you're in a stained glass sanctuary where we recognize that we're all broken we're just more aware of it than the folks who show up on Sunday, right? We've, we've been blessed with an awareness th of our need. There's so many people that walk into church on a Sunday and don't really know what they need. They think they're there um, to fill a, fulfill a duty, to, to pass a check mark off. We're not doing check marks here. We're doing life. We're doing life with Jesus through the 12 steps in a way that will make us more like him on a daily basis. So, Lord, we lift up, uh, we lift up, uh, uh, and do, please continue to uh, keep Darlin and I in your prayers. We have some travel, some other folks, we're, we're going up for the leadership retreat for Recovery Church. If you don't know, Recovery Church has about 30 locations now. In three years, it's grown to 30 locations. Uh, we hope to have one in every city uh, eventually. I think uh, uh, this is a great way, and quite frankly, there's, there's no one that doesn't need it. Wade's going to talk about that here on a Sunday, about the need for recovery, who needs it and who doesn't. Uh, the list of who needs it is much longer, right? It's not restricted to people who have been homeless, addicted to drugs. You don't have to have uh, ever taken a drink to need recovery, right? Um, but keep us lifted up for that travel, for that time of training, and also uh, for Darlin and I as we go to Haiti next month. Haiti, as you uh, probably know or may not fully understand, is quite a mess. There's a lot of violence. There's complete devastation from the earthquake that was on top of having their president assassinated which is on top of already being the poorest nation in the hemisphere uh, and so we uh, we have a lot of work to do there and a lot of prayers needed so um, keep that lifted up and we are going with a, a Christian TV program to film there as well so hopefully that will allow us to get that message out better than uh, we have so far uh, praise uh, pray for Wade and Angie as they run um, celebrate recovery here they're in the back building on Friday nights uh, much like us, they, they have a great thing to carry forward uh, in that combination of the 12 steps in the scriptures, uh, and we really need more people to be there to, to experience it. We work better together, right? As a body, you know, all the members work together in concert. When we try and do this alone, we're not that good at it. Um, so, Father, we just thank you. We thank you for Pam's words. We thank you that you so inspired the founders of AA to find a way to reach people who might not ever grace the doors of a church with your truth. So many have come to know you through that approach of the 12 steps, only to later be lifted up even further and higher through programs like Recovery Church, Celebrate Recovery, and their home church. Lord, we pray that more would come to know you that way, that more doors would be open, that there'd be less resistance, and more lives would be forever changed and saved. Lord, we pray for your blessing upon those that come through here, that hear these words, that you would carry them forth in a mighty way, Lord, and that your world would be done, that we would keep our, our hearts bowed to you as we're on our knees before you. And we thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Now, uh, if you want a free Bible, <laughs> you sat through. And